Hi, welcome to On The Edge. I'm your host, Matthew Wexler, and you are watching Edge Media Network, your go-to source for LGBTQ plus news and entertainment. Kindness is queen. Nina West has won hearts worldwide and has been named the most Googled drag queen in the world with more than 7.8 billion searches. The creation of actor, singer, songwriter, LGBTQ plus philanthropist, Andrew Levitt. There is so much more drag on the horizon. It was just announced that Andrew will headline a brand new tour of the hit musical, Hairspray, playing Edna Turnblad after being hand selected by some of the original creative team, including Tony Award winner, Jerry Mitchell, uh, director, Jack O'Brien. I am so excited to have Andrew with us today to talk all things Hairspray and so much more. But first, let's take a look at some of the many faces of Nina West. So many great looks. I love that Emmy Award uh, portrait when Andrew made history, really as the first drag queen to walk the red carpet of the primetime Emmy Awards. And now he's making history again in the revival tour of Hairspray, getting ready to launch. Uh, remember, we are live. So if you have questions, be sure to drop them in the chat. Without further ado, let's welcome Andrew Levitt. Hi, Matthew. How are you? Hi. I am good, Andrew. How are you today? I'm so good. I'm so excited to be joining you today. It's really exciting to be able to chat with you. You're so happy and optimistic. We've chatted before, <laughs> and I remember from our last conversation, I'm like, he's always in such a good mood. We're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you know, it's uh, especially during the pandemic, I was just looking forward to ch chatting with somebody. <laughs> My yeah, phone was exactly. so small. So I was like, oh, good. I get to talk to somebody today. I know. I feel like it was like these two polarized wor worlds. There were people who are in relationships who were like hunkered down and that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I live alone and I have a dog and it was just me sort of staring at the four walls with my puppy, which I was kind of okay with most of the time. <laughs> yeah, that was me as well. I have two dogs and myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I want to talk, um, are you uh, calling us from Columbus today? Is that where you're at I now? I am. Yeah. I'm All right. Ohio. I love Columbus. Yeah. I am an Ohio boy as well. I was born in Cleveland and went to school outside of Cincinnati. We would drive up to uh, Columbus for Halloween and just have a gay old time, which I'm sure is still great. I would love to hear just kind of your snapshot on Columbus and what your first early exposure was to the arts and then really how you first kind of dipped your toe into drag. Yeah, so Columbus was never really uh, kind of the plan. I went to college at Denison University, which is in Granville, which is about 45 minutes northeast of Columbus. Right. And after I graduated, I, uh, I was going to move to New York, but I ended up in Columbus. Um, and so it was by pure happenstance that I kind of fell in love with the city and uh, I what my my kind of encounters and engagement with the city really only grew as my drag uh, kind of took off and I started to really focus on drag. Um, but I did see a city that was super progressive comparatively to kind of everywhere else. I'm from Northeast Ohio. I'm from Canton, Ohio, which is uh, oh, right. a smaller, yeah, smaller, smaller town. And um, uh, so I was kind of more exposed to a much more progressive city and, you know, Columbus and it's, Short North area was was this thriving kind of gay mecca, this little gay neighborhood that you know had a gay coffee shop in the corner and a gay video store, and a, a, you know a, a gay T-shirt store and um, gay bars kind of scattered all throughout this this like five block radius, and it was just really kind of this you know safe little Shangri La um, that really kind of I think allowed me in a really small sense to embrace who I was, but also feel like I was surrounded by all of this magic and this kind of wonder of queerness, which, which was, you know, to someone who didn't have any exposure to it um, prior to really moving to Columbus after college, it felt, I felt like I was living in San Francisco or New York. Yeah. Yeah. Know, a, did you, um, 
I'm curious, did you grow up, did your parents take you to see theater? I see all these amazing posters behind you, Hairspray <laughs> included, but also a bunch of shows that I love and have seen. Um, yeah. We'll get to Hairspray, but did you, um, I'm just curious what your exposure to musical theater was as a child. Yeah, so my, my the very first show I saw it was Cats. My dad took me uh, to Cleveland to Playhouse Square to see the National yes. Tour of Cats. And then, um, my grandma, Peggy, my mom's mom, bought me the soundtrack recording to Phantom of the Opera, I think it was in third grade for my birthday. And I fell in love with kind of this, I fell in love with the story. And then so I kind of immersed myself in the Gaston Leroux book as a kid. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? What am I doing? Right, right. Uh, but, but that was my initial, yeah, my parents really did foster this love and this, uh, and this growth. Music was always playing in the house. Um, so I would hear Rodgers and Hammerstein. I would hear you know, opera. I would hear classical music. And then I would really dive, connect deeply to musical theater specifically. Yeah. Did you see touring shows and things like that? Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. I remember when uh, in Canton, Ohio, we got, we were, we got, a tour of Jesus Christ Superstar that was such a big deal. No, <laughs> such a big deal. But most of you know, but most of the time I would go on I would go up to Cleveland to go see the national tours. And they have an incredible national tour schedule. I oh, always yeah. have. Yeah. And it's so, one of the largest um, in the country. And I think recently it's grown to uh I mean, hopefully, you know, as we're sort of moving through the pandemic, it'll return. But one of the largest subscriptions in in the in the country. I grew up going to shows there too. The first show I saw on tour was Annie, and then my parents took me to see La Cage aux Faux in the same season. I was in fourth grade. I was like, <laughs> I love this. <laughs> you said, wait a minute, this is fabulous. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you ended up in Columbus after school, and um, I. I think from what I remember, you sort of dipped your toe in drag in college. Is that when you first started um, sort of experimenting with it as a performance? Yeah, style? yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't, you know, Matthew. I never really saw myself as a drag queen. I saw myself, you know, I, in college we booked drag shows for the, mm -hmm. the end of year event for the for the university, our LGBTQ plus organization, student organization, booked those shows, and so that was my exposure to it. And as a kind of a joke, my friend Justin said, "Why don't we do our senior year? Why don't we do drag?" And I was like, "Uh, sure, one time, why not?" And that one time absolutely changed. <laughs> yeah, life, like, you know what I mean. I mean, the rest of it's kind of uh, history because I met all you know that one time introduced me to all of these people who were doing drag in Columbus, and little did I know that I was going to end up in Columbus, and then little did I know that I would you know be finding my chosen family through all of these entertainers, and you know drag does have this huge network. Um, you know, really, it's such a small, well, vast across the country. It really is a small community. And yeah. so throughout the years, I was meeting queens all over and everyone knew everyone else. And uh, drag, yeah, drag shaped my own entire life and changed it. Yeah, I'd like to talk about one in particular, and that is your drag yeah. mother in Columbus, yeah. Virginia. Oh, mother, if all mothers <laughs> looked like that, right? I can imagine <laughs> my mother looking like that. I, am my, so I can't help it, my mom is sexy. <laughs> she is indeed. I'm curious what she's imparted to you, uh, to I, I guess at the beginning to help you uh, discover and sort of step into your own drag style, and also um, what she imparted to you to really be a role model in community, because that's been such an important part of your journey, just not on stage, but off stage as well. Yeah, I, you know, it's kind of, it's interesting because I think I learned both from my drag mother and my my biological mother, kind of these very similar attributes, right? Um, Chris Virginia is a tremendous, tremendously caring person, uh, so has this huge drag family and was I was really luck on, lucky to be welcomed into it and to really kind of watch him interact and engage with the community and learn that drag didn't happen just on stage. You know, drag happened in the audience. It happened with, it was more than just what you were performing on stage. Um, it was the relationships you were building off stage and how you really in, interact and engage with the community. And I saw him doing that and I, was just blown away by the power of drag, I think, is what I saw with Virginia. And I I saw that and I took it, you know, and embraced it to make it my own and recognize that we have a, a responsibility as queens, right? And, and, it, and she taught me that, that it goes back to like Stonewall and way yeah. before that, like we queens are the mouthpieces and the pillars of our communities, our subcultural communities. And we need to not only entertain, but we need to speak up and utilize our voices and our positions to stand in, 
in and up for truth and for what's right and how do we do that right you know sometimes it is just performing uh uh ariana grande song on stage to make people forget about what's going on in the world and sometimes it's talking about voter registration or bipoc communities who are highly at risk or our lgbtqia plus elderly or youth who are struggling so vastly right it, 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 yeah. our role as a queen does evolve in any given moment and it shifts and, sh and, it, and it does take shape with whatever's happening really specifically that night and in the bar, in the community. And queens have to be really attentive to that. And Virginia really taught me that, like be attentive not only to the people around you, but be attentive to the community. Who's coming to the show? Who's, yeah. who needs something? You know, that, that was really powerful. And I've yeah. really run with it since. It's a great, uh, it's a great way to to approach your work, and I think you're constantly doing this cultural temperature take, sort of being aware of what's happening, um, not just in this microcosm, but on a much bigger scale. And to that point, early on, you started the Nina West Foundation. So you know, many many queens do a lot of charitable work, but to me, it, it seems as if very early on, it, it became sort of a, a pillar of your of your brand and since then it's you've raised millions and millions of dollars which is incredible yes. uh i'm curious what some of the projects are that you've worked on but also why and how it became such a fund fundamental part of of your career you know matthew it, matthew it was really unintentional it was something i just felt like needed to be done i felt like mm -hmm. i needed to be a part of these conversations and these moments and these movements, right? You know, I had a professor uh, who uh, was HIV positive. And that was the first person I had met who was HIV positive in my life, had no exposure to it. And I met, I met someone who taught me the value of understanding what it meant uh, in our LGBTQIA plus community, in our gay community, what it meant to gay men during this time period. And that wanted that made me want to, you know, use this to, as I grew and, and get, got this platform, use my platform to speak for him and to advocate for him mm -hmm. um, and to advocate in turn for people that I didn't know yet who were going to share their stories with me and tell their stories with me or, or didn't know that friends that I would lose, you know, I mean, it, every, every, turn and every nuance of my career has been a reaction, I think, to interpersonal relationships that I had built or were building at the time. So I didn't intend to do all this charity work. I intended to want to take care of people that meant or mean a lot to me. Um, and I don't know if that's a like a paternal or maternal instinct. Um, I don't know where that comes from. Right, but uh, I never intended what, like, what the career, like, what I've done, and my, I just never intended for it to be what it is. I really just wanted to do right by the people that were changing my life and impacting my life. Right, you know, like that's what I felt a responsibility, and yeah, I think that's kind of I do think that's an important takeaway for anyone who's watching this. Is it's really important to not to open yourself up to the world because it does really change your viewpoint and your perspective and how it all does kind of correlate. Especially now, I mean, we're living in such a polarized time on a, on a lot of issues, but uh, mm -hmm. I would I would agree it seems instinctual for you to have this kind of uh, parental nurturing quality, um, which you gravi gravitated towards. And I think it makes this next step in your career just this very natural uh, evolution as you're heading out in, in sort of this larger than life internal role in Hairspray. Of course, I just have to ask. We all want to know how did you get this gig, which is just so amazing. <laughs> because I think um, the tour was supposed to um, launch about a year ago. Yeah. I mean, I think it was supposed to launch twenty twenty. So I'm not sure if you were part of that those conversations back then. Or all right, I, all right. So just okay, tell so us. Matthew, tell us. Tell okay, us. so I was in Indianapolis in the summer of twenty nineteen, and I uh, my phone's ringing, and it's a New York City area code a two one two, and I was like, oh, it must be. It must be my agent. <laughs> so, I mean, whatever. I didn't get a call from my I never got calls from my agent. <laughs> so, I was like, maybe, maybe that's a call from my agent. And so, I answer the phone, and it's Jerry Mitchell, who, and my voice is cracking. It's Jerry directly Mitchell. Directly calling you? Directly calling me. <laughs> um, and so uh, first and foremost, I was like, he goes, Nina West, it's Jerry Mitchell. 
Um, and I was, and he goes, I, I'm from, I'm from a hairspray legally, like, and I was like, I know who you are. Um, I've been <laughs> I love that he had to are. explain who he was. I, mean, who he was. I had, and he, and he says, you know, I had this idea, and I, I had a dream about you last night. Oh my God. You've got to be Edna Turnblad. And um, I laughed, and then I think I started to choke up a little bit, and then. Um, he said a few other things and then it kind of, the conversation kind of stopped and like, right. He like, <laughs> went about his business and said, I'll be in touch. And then, uh, so that was like around July of 2019 and then December of 2019 conversation, I get another call and conversation resumes and says, Hey, we really would like to meet with you. There's a conversation about hairspray going back on the road and we would really like for you to be considered for Edna. And so I, uh, at that point, I, I kept everything pretty much to myself. And then at that point, I started to alert my management and my agent. And I was like, okay, so Jerry Mitchell called me. And he called me earlier, but I didn't want to tell you because I didn't want to jinx it. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm very like, and not that I'm superstitious, but I'm like, I just don't, there's no need to like alert people and have them bother Jerry Mitchell. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And so, um, so I went to New York um, in January and I met with Jerry and Jack um, and had um, a brief conversation with both of them. I mean, Jack O'Brien is a theatrical legend. And so, yeah. I mean, Jerry Mitchell's a legend. And uh, so to meet with these men who really are icons and um, I was very overwhelmed. And I'm a gay theater, I'm a theater nerd. And so it, well, I, can I remember- Well, I can see by the Queen, I, Matthew, I, Matthew, I went to go see Legally Blonde uh, like in previews. And Jerry Mitchell was there, and I saw Jerry Mitchell and little gay Andrew, and I don't know what year this was, maybe 2000, I don't remember, 2007? I don't know. I went up to Jerry Mitchell, I was like, oh, I love you so much. And he's like, oh, it's so nice to meet you. And then kind of went about his business. <laughs> Never yeah. thinking that was my interaction with Jerry Mitchell. Um, so then I, I auditioned. I did audition for the part. I read for the part, and I sang for the part. And um, I remember after I sang um, Timeless to Me, I sang my part in Timeless to me for Jack. And Jack Jack sat back in his chair and he goes, All right, I've seen everything I've seen. I've seen everything I need to say. Let's go get something to eat. And it was like, it was, it was, it, it was over before it started. And oh my um, gosh. All right. I just have to explain to yeah. people like the um, sort of that initial call. You know, there's this term in the business called offer only, like Patty Lapone. Burnett Peters, like these, you know, like larger than life leading ladies get the offer. Divas. Only. Like, yeah. yeah, they're not going into audition. And then Andrew, you're hanging out and Jerry Mitchell calls you and he gives you an offer as well. Technically you did go in an audition, but I would say, I, I would did. call that when you rehash the story, oh, we just workshopped a little bit. We just, you know, we just- <laughs> I mean, I am not, I mean, I'm not, I mean, yeah. Okay, Matt, fine. Fine, Matthew, fine. Well, fine. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell it that way. So the show has, um, you know, so much legacy. Obviously the original John Waters film featured Divine. Uh, the original Broadway musical featured Harvey Firestein, And then um, later, uh, oh, there they are. They all are the, some of the, of the, of the performers. And then we had John Travolta yeah. do the film version. <laughs> I don't know that what to say shady. about that. That was shady. We've got some of the performers. And right. Jerry. Well, I mean, he's up there too. So I'm curious <laughs> what your familiarity was with the show. <laughs> oh, well, you know, Matthew, th this is another thing. I have an older sister. I have two older sisters. And um, so I was, exp I like, you know, again, music was playing in the house all the time. My parents, yeah. my dad loved music. So we heard everything from Abba to Queen. And then my sister, I have an older sister who also was really obsessed with pop culture. And she loved John Waters. And so I remember watching Hairspray, the film. And not, I don't think I knew that John, I don't think I knew that Divine was a man. I don't think I had that comprehension. This film, the movie came out in 1989. I think I was 11. Mm -hmm. So I, had the, I didn't know. But I saw, I do remember seeing that movie early. And yeah. I remember uh, Ricky Lake doing the dance uh, and, you know, trying to stamp out the roaches. That was a very vivid memory. And then I got the opportunity. I was, uh, I was a server. Um, I stayed, I was, yeah, my story, I was going to move to New York and I didn't, I, I stayed in Columbus and I was a server and I saved all my money. And so then um, my first trip back to New York was in, July of 2002, and I saved up all my money, and I bought a, um, a preview ticket. It was three days before opening of Hairspray the Musical. And um, yeah. 
I remember intermission, Mark Shaman uh, um, was out pacing in front of the theater, uh, of the Neil Simon Theater uh, intermission, pacing, and you could see he was, he was just like overwrought with like <laughs> concern and thought and uh, probably making notes and changes of what was going to happen. And um, it was just, I, it, that show changed my life. I can't even tell you when I saw that show, I wanted to be in that show. I went home and I produced drag shows for years that closed with You Can't Stop the Beat. Every single, these large production shows with 15 to 20 dancers that closed with You Can't Stop the Beat. We did every single song from the soundtrack with the soundtrack. Oh, wow. From I Can Hear the Bells to Mama, I'm a Big Girl Now to Welcome to the 60s. I mean, every single number in these big lip sync drag productions. Um, and then, I, yeah, I had the opportunity to, I watched the film the musical film and then i was thrilled that they did the live version uh with harvey and martin short yeah. and ariana grande uh i just was thrilled that we in christian channel was we got a revisit to i think what was closer to the broadway musical um yeah but i yeah. think the show is really important i think the energy is really important i think it's subversiveness is really important it is queer i think it's queer canon you know i think hairspray is mm. queer canon yet at the same time so mainstream which is really magical how the two of those worlds can really kind of correlate and kind of intersect and also the message is also super important especially as we revisit it right so a couple things hairspray came after 9 9 11. it was like i think one of the one of the first musicals that opened after 9 11 that i think allowed a lot of people to say it's we can exhale a little bit and we can celebrate a little bit and we can sing again together Mm -hmm. um, which I think was very therapeutic, especially for New Yorkers. And then here we are. Uh, now we're after, we're it's still in the midst of this pandemic, but after a long quarantine, a 15-month quarantine, and the show gets to go back out on the road and I think remind people, hey, we're really better together than we are divided. We really are better together when we're singing and dancing and celebrating one another and our differences and our similarities. And we really are better like uh i think in a, in a in a moment in a movement of this of the story and so it's kind of great how they it's in, it's it's impressive to me the gravity i think of where the show is coming right now yeah and i, and hope, I think and i hope yeah no I, I agree with you and it sort of shows you know for these pieces that have a legacy the timeliness and timelessness of them sort of inter intersect when the stories can be retold and revisited and they're still just mm -hmm. as relevant as they were when they were originally produced from the original right. film to the musical version well there have been other edna turnblad i wanted to surprise you with this particular photo of a of an old-timey crush that i had um oh my gosh oh michael my ball <laughs> I also had a crush on Michael Ball. When All he was right. singing Love Changes Everything in that music video from Aspects of Love, I said, yes. who is that man? Yes. Also, for that's a deep cut for anyone who's not a theater guy. <laughs> Aspects of Love. All right, so for all you watching who have no idea who Michael Ball is, original production of Les Miserables played Marius and then was chosen by Andrew Lloyd Webber to you know play the young male lead and hit a high B or B flat in Aspects of Love, which lasted like two seconds on Broadway. But it's a brilliant song. And he's so adorable. And here he is uh, playing Edna Turnblad. I think he did, I don't know if he did the original West End production, but he did a huge... Did huge tour throughout the UK. So you are stepping into big shoes, my friend, big shoes. You know, it's not, that's no pressure at all, right? You know, no. <laughs> I mean, for me, Matthew, like, this is like, everyone for years has asked me if you ever got the chance to do a character, who would it be? And I'm like, Edna Turnblad, Edna Turnblad. And I thought it just wouldn't happen. And um, I'm grateful. I think a lot of this might come from when I, my time on Drag Race and when I did uh, Harvey for Snatch Game, I think that mm -hmm. allowed people to see me in a different way. But I also do believe the character requires somebody who is much more open to the world. And I think, you know, kind of like I said earlier, again, I don't know if it's paternal or, or maternal, um, but I think the character requires somebody who is just a little bit more gentler. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, um, so I um, I'm 
I'm just thrilled that they saw that in me. And yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they're huge shoes. They're huge shoes. I wear a size 15, so let's go. Oh, well, then you're the perfect. <laughs> it's like typecasting. It's perfect. <laughs> I want to ask you because you sort you mentioned Drag Race, and I feel we are seeing a, a couple fellow drag alum like um mm -hmm. roy you know bianca del rio is going out on everybody loves mm -hmm. jamie tina turner who we had on last week is doing this sort of broadway homage but it's an interesting um shift for some of you that have those roots in theater and and mm -hmm. are uh, more of a performer multifaceted mm -hmm. performer um does it feel like a pivot for you to at least for now put nina west on the back burner and step into a different set of heels that's a great question. I don't think so. I think this feels really natural because I think who I am at my core prior to Drag Race, remember I was doing drag for 19 years before I got on Drag Race. And so, mm -hmm. and for people who know me, my drag is really rooted in camp and the theatricality and the musical mm -hmm. theater elements that uh, I learned in school. I have a degree in theater and that I, that I developed just as a ridiculous, cheesy, corny performer, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I'm rooted in this world. Um, and I think that when you when you drop those names, Bianca Del Rio, Roy Haylock, who has a who has who had a career on Broadway uh, working on uh, costuming and hair prior to drag race, also hugely successful drag queen before drag race. Uh, Tina Burner, who is a New York queen. Um, yeah. Then there's like Jan Sport and uh, Rose and um, Alexis Michelle. I mean, there are these New York queens who just live, eat, and breathe theater. And I think it's some, for, as you know, that's a, that's a big part of our drag tradition. These cabaret acts and these storytellers from Varla Jean Merman to Edie to, I mean, I, to Dina Martina, right? Like these are these are queens who are rooted in the tradition of musical theater. And um and the cabaret art and the art you know the art of presentation and I think it's for me it does feel like a logical next step to allow Nina to inform Andrew about this next step but to be challenged intrinsically because Edna is not a drag queen Edna yeah. is a mom you know and I have my my task and my job is. Herculean, you know, it's it's to get every audience in every city to believe that I am this this 15-year-old girl's mother. And like that's exciting to me because it's not this doesn't happen every day. And I'm gonna get, get to them when this tour is over. I'm gonna get to apply that to Nina again. And um, but every every ounce of the 20 years that I've been doing this is going to inform every second I'm on that stage. Yeah, you know, there are so so many compelling themes of the show about um, racism that are unfortunately mm -hmm. so relevant today as they were when the f the show first originated and beforehand. Um, you know, in your season of Drag Race, you won Miss Congeniality and um, RuPaul called you America's Sweetheart. So um, I feel like it's been so important for you to go that route to, to be someone who's inclusive rather than a a uh, queen who's sort of sort of famous for reading and other antics. That's just kind of in your DNA, do you think? Yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I also want you to know, hey, that's me. I love that. Sports. And I love that message, you know. Thank you. Thanks. You know, um, I don't think, you know, it's just for me, it's just who I am. And, you know, Bianca Del Rio, who is the queen of shade, is also one of the most, like, the loveliest people I've ever met in my entire life. You yeah. know, Roy is one of the, one of the best people you could hope to meet, but also like reading and the art of reading. It's so, if you do it right, it's like, it's not really intended to be nasty or bite. I mean, it's biting, but it's not, it's not meant to like make someone feel inadequate. It's just, it's supposed, it's like a um, verbal sword play. Um, and to like kind of have people check your wits and match your, and match your wits. And sometimes maybe I just don't feel as witty. <laughs> you know? no. <laughs> no, but, no, but like, you, you know, it, like, you know what I mean, Matthew? Like, I feel like it's just an, it's such, such a vital part of my community of drag queens and like what, how yeah. we perform. And, but it's just not some, it's just, it's just not me. Um, yeah. and, 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 um, and I think that's okay. You know, I think it takes all of us. It takes all types to kind I of totally allow agree. everyone. Yeah. I think it's okay that I'm, I'm not. And I think it's great that others are. Yeah, you know, like, and I and yeah. I think it's kind of reflective in um, you know sort of some of the experiences you had this past Pride season, which are really sort of um, extending an olive branch to LGBTQ plus youth. Yeah. Um, 
things like a Nickelodeon and Blues Clues and Disney Plus. I'd love if you could just hear or share with us a highlight or two of what Pride was like for you this year, because it felt like you were really leaning into that. Like this is something we have to look at the next generation and create a, an era of inclusivity. <sighs> Oh yeah, Matthew. Yeah, um, this has been a pretty banner year for me, uh, uh, especially as like again opening doors and wanting to go down these kind of paths that I've really seen myself. And um, I was lucky enough to work with Nickelodeon on Blues Clues, then an, an original Pride song of my own with a Nickelodeon, and then um, I was for really fortunate enough to host the Disney Plus Pride Spectacular, sing with Kermit the Frog. Um, I mean, who gets to do that? Uh, you know, um, and, uh, you know, and like next steps, I'm developing uh, a kid's a kids television show with uh, Stupid Buddy Studios and Bobby Burke of Queer Eye. And we're, I mean, I'm actively wanting to go into this space and allow queer parents or parents of queer or LGBTQIA plus children to know mm -hmm. that they can have access to programming that speaks to their values and to what they believe in and the conversations they want to have in their household. And I think that that's really, really valuable. And I also think it's long overdue. So I, I'm really honored that I get to kind of lead this uh, charge and help be a part of this movement, I think, for LGBTQI, LGBTQIA plus families and their children. Yeah, yeah. I have to ask you, um, are you taking your dogs with you on the road? We have a question here that <laughs> popped up from one of our... Oh, I have two dogs, yes. Yeah, so I have two larger larger dogs that are about 70 pounds each. Oh my God. They're, yeah, they're huge. <laughs> they look like they look like they're little terriers, but they're really big, giant, like sheep dogs. They're just really big. Their names are Edgar and Felicity, and they're also senior citizens. So they're, uh, they're older for their breed. And um, hi, Chase. And... Um, um, and so uh, I'm not taking them on the road with me, which is really, um, it's a decision based on really for their benefit. And so sure. uh, my, my best friend, Patricia, is going to, as she always does, um, is jumping in to help me take care of them and allow them to still be comfortable and still be course, at, at their home, which is really, really, really important to me. Yeah. Yeah. Before we let you go, um, I think. I have one last question for you. I was looking at your tour schedule and you're like <laughs> literally going everywhere from Matthew, California it's, it's... to Connecticut. Like literally, <laughs> I, people think I'm exaggerating. No, it's like, it's... There's like a thousand <laughs> cities on this tour. Um, and it's... you traveled a lot for work. So is there yeah. any place that you haven't been that you're like, oh wow, I'm so excited. I'm gonna have 36 hours in the city to <laughs> check it out. I mean, you, that's pretty normal, right? So, like, if you're going on to, for, like, for a drag show, you know, and, like, support of Drag Race, like, you might be going to Chicago, and you're there for, you land, you go to your hotel, it's, you paint your face, you go to do the show. It's like, what, have you seen that Gaga meme where she's like, hotel, club, bus, right. it's, it's, it's like that. But I'm excited to do this. I'm excited to go to Appleton, Wisconsin. I've heard that's a really, really wonderful community. And so we're doing okay. we're doing time in Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, we're going, to, I mean, we really are going everywhere. I'm excited to go to Miami. I'm I look, to Tennessee what, Theater in Knoxville. All right. Tennessee Theater in Knoxville. Um, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, I'm, I'm on the first leg for sure. So all the dates that you see on my calendar on my website, I'm on every one of those dates and every one of yeah. those cities. And that's been a question that people are asking, are you going to be here? Are you going to be here? And I'm like... So I'm on all those dates in the first leg. I know Columbus, Ohio is coming in this, I think the second or third leg. So hopefully I get to be a part of that. Um, mm -hmm. My hometown, that'd be really amazing. But I'm mostly excited. I'm just mostly excited to have this experience with this incredible cast and this team and be able to share the message of this show on the road and really work on some, this one thing for the, for a 10 month period and, yeah. and, make this this is like gonna be life-changing for me and um every like you know it's crazy Matthew I was talking like I went to New York and I talked with Matt Lentz who's the assistant director who's uh, a big part of this process for Hairspray on tour and um I, he was introducing me to people who've done Hairspray and uh, you know in, in different iterations whether it was in yeah. Las Vegas or it was um in New York at, at some point um and even Mar I talked to Marissa Jarrett Winoker and Every person has said this show will change your life. It changes the fabric of who you are. It, it is you have the you have the ability to go out and give joy to people every single night. Is it going to be easy? No, 
but what you get to do is like something that very few people have the opportunity to do and this show will change your life and i like have heard that over and over from every single person that i've talked to who have not you know you've talked to different people who've done different big different experiences whether it be broadway or film and i've never heard this through line with one piece you know of art that ever that these people who've been a part of it have shared and I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm really You're going to have an amazing time. And we've had all these comments popping up from your fans. So, you know, there's people out there across the country uh, who are so excited to see you as well. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, it's Matthew. so great chatting with you again. again. And I feel like uh, this is just the beginning of many more conversations we're going to have in the future. So I hope so. I adore again. talking to you. I just you know, thank you for your time. Thank you very, very thank much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care now. What a charmer. Oh my gosh, if you wanna see Andrew and Hairspray, fear not. As I mentioned, the tour is basically going everywhere. Uh, you can find all the tour dates at hairspraytour.com. Uh, I'm sure Andrew is also gonna be posting on social media from the road once they get rolling. I also hope you can tune in next week uh, for our next episode of On the Edge when we welcome Joe English from Hope in a Box. That's on August 24th. We're gonna be talking about how important it is to create an inclusive, accepting environment when our LGBTQ youth head back to school this fall. And then the following week, we have Josie Smith Malave on August 31st for the next installment of our Living Sober series. Uh, we're on a short hiatus in early September, but returning with a bang when Margaret Cho joins us on September 21st, an episode you won't wanna miss. Of course, you can always tune in to edgemedianetwork.com for all the latest news and follow us on social media to see those breaking stories first. Next time, I encourage you to live on the edge.